Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, the first event of our PhD seminar series in the new year and the fourth event overall. Um, today, it's my pleasure to announce uh, Professor Thomas Lux from the University of Kiel in Germany, a city far north in the Germany at the sea, very nice. Um, he uh, did a PhD at the University of uh, Würzburg, uh, which is in the state of Bavaria, also a very nice city. Um, and his research um, in the past mainly focused on behavioral finance, uh, in particular heterogeneous agents models and evolutionary models. Uh, and this is what he is going to uh, present today. Um, and I, I leave it to uh, Thomas now to, to get you through uh, things. Okay, thank you Christian for the invitation uh, to St. Andrews and for the nice introduction. Actually it was quite an experience yesterday when I came here from Germany flying to the north and experiencing a temperature increase of 20 degrees Celsius from minus 15 in Kiel to plus 5 here in St. Andrews. Germany these days it's really an icebox, but you actually uh, you have much warmer weather. It's quite amazing. Yeah, what I'm going to present, what I'm going to present to you, is uh, yeah an introduction to quantitative modeling concepts for interacting heterogeneous agents that can be used in many different contexts. I will show you some examples because I am a financial economist. Um, I will show you some examples from my work on. Uh, behavioral finance, but in principle, what I'm going to present to you, the mathematical concepts, can be used in very diverse areas. There have been there have been applications that you can find in the literature in regional economics, in industrial economics, uh, in labor market economics. You can even go beyond economics and think about applications of these apparatus in sociology, in political science. I might indicate some of these applications later on. Um, Without changing much of the fundamental of the fundamental input in terms of uh, the mathematical modeling concepts, this is all relatively new to economics, and it's new because interaction and heterogeneity are uh, aspects, so to say, of economic life that, in my view and in the view of many others, are very important. I and mean, you can hardly imagine economics without interacting agents, without interaction interaction of economic agents. But these aspects actually have been neglected uh, in the literature because of the dominance of the representative agent paradigm. And as far as we deviate, and it seems the profession is deviating more and more from the representative agent paradigm, we need new modeling techniques in order to cope with non-representative agents, with heterogeneous agents who have different attributes. And we need to develop modeling techniques for interaction of agents. And what I'm presenting here is a particular way, and I think a very useful way, but also a very uncommon way, so to say, in terms of what economists are used to, used to do in their mathematical models, to introduce heterogeneity via stochasticity of the behavior of agents. In a sense, it's not really, it's not really uncommon. It links to other areas of economics, but I'm going to, to uh, provide more details on that in a moment. So that's actually the plan. Basically, uh, I'm going to present to you in a hopefully uh, comprehensible way and intuitive way without going too much into the mathematical foundations, but only providing material that can be used in hands-on applications, uh, the mathematical apparatus, plus some hopefully instructive applications of these apparatus. That's basically the schedule. The schedule. I will say a few words on motivation, but then I will go relatively quickly, deeply into uh, mathematical formalism, and will mm, and will introduce concepts like the so-called master equation, which is a general uh, dynamic law for the development of a probability distribution over agents, over states, over whatsoever, over time and can be used in order to extract useful information on the behavior of a stochastic system of interacting agents, namely to extract 
uh, information about the means and higher moments. Higher moments are particularly interesting if you think about financial application. The mean, typically, if you think about returns, is not very interesting because the return, uh, the mean of the returns is close to zero if you have a unit root or martingale process for prices. But higher moments have interesting dynamics, so that is particularly interesting. I will show you an example where we get explicit dynamics from an agent-based model of the second moment of prices, so that we can say something about possible behavioral foundations for heteroscedasticity, volatility clustering. And in fact, you can think about uh, dynamic laws, deriving dynamic laws from this basic formalism, even for third and fourth moment, there might be dynamic uh, dynamic evolution, interesting dynamic evolution in third and fourth moments. It's very cumbersome to di develop these dynamic laws, but hopefully if you have worked through the material here and have followed the lecture, you would know in principle how to do it. You would know how to do it, and in fact it's a nice exercise for PhD students to derive these somewhat nasty, nasty dynamic laws and look at uh, the patterns of dynamics in third and fourth moments. So, but besides, besides moments, you can also look at the full probability density and you can get results on the transient density and the stationary density from these apparatus. And in most cases, of course, we will not have closed form solutions, but these apparatus will be helpful in simulating systems and getting some, some basic insight about their behavior. So that will be uh, the fundamental mathematical concepts. In fact, I will draw much on the development of these concepts as it has, as it has occurred in uh, statistical physics, which also deals with interaction of entities, of molecules, of particles. And uh, so there is a, there's a certain, certain overlap in the sense of interest in the concept of interaction between basic units, between economics and physics, and it seems to me that uh, the concepts that have been developed here in statistical physics are particularly useful, particularly useful for applications in economics. Yeah, that's uh, the fundamental concepts, and then as I said, I will present some applications in financial economics using heterogeneous beliefs of agents and investigating their influence on asset price dynamics I will move on to more complicated artificial markets with herding and strategy choice. And uh, I have introduced, if time permits, a new chapter in which I will move on from theory to estimation. Because that's something I have been working on recently. The methodology developed here can, as it turns out, also very easily be applied in order to estimate the parameters of the theoretical models which, of course, is, is nice to link empirical research and theoretical research in this area. For a long time, in fact, that was purely a uh, purely theoretical development, but now, over the recent years, one has also started to try and estimate the parameters of these models. To provide some links and some overall characterization, of what I'm going to introduce. Uh, essentially, I try to formalize a stochastic framework for socio-economic interactions on a very abstract formal level first, and then going to particular applications. This will be, in a sense, similar to uh, what perhaps some of you might know, namely the literature on discrete choice. Discrete choice, which is well known in industrial economics and in uh, microeconomics, think about the problem here in Scotland, perhaps, of choosing a particular brand of whiskey in the supermarket. Uh, this is, of course, a discrete choice problem, because you only have so many possible brands of whiskey, and then discrete choice would formalize, would formalize the consumer's choice given the attributes of whiskey, the taste, the price, and so on and so forth, in order to come out with a probabilistic is a probabilistic description of consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. So that it depends, depends on 
something like an underlying stochastic utility function. Of course, we would not know all the attributes of the utility function of consumers. There is some notion of heterogeneity here implicit in this modeling framework because you have to explain that there is more than one brand of whiskey that is demanded by consumers. And in order to do so, you have to allow for uh, heterogeneity in tastes. And this heterogeneity in the discrete choice framework comes in via stochastic components in the utility function. Stochastic components that make different consumers choose different brands of whiskies, but you also have systematic components that explain why perhaps a certain brand has 60% uh, of market penetration and another brand has only 20% and so on and so forth. So that will be similar. There's similarity here to an established uh, strand of research in economics where we have some where we have some heterogeneity of agents. But the main difference is that this is essentially a static framework because of the problems it is applied to. And what I will be looking at is a dynamic framework. I will be looking at the development of a system with interactions over time, which is particularly interesting, of course, in finance, because we want to see something. We want to get some evolution of prices, but might also be interesting in macroeconomics and other areas as well. And another, another difference, in fact, if you, if you look at uh, the theoretical work on discrete choice with social interactions, is that I will consider from the outset finite populations. Whereas in many economic models, we have the relatively unrealistic assumption of infinite populations. Think about how often you have read about a population on the unit interval between zero and one. You have read so often about it that it seems to be a harmless assumption, but it is not. It is not. So we will be looking explicitly at the number of agents in the system and how the number of agents in the system influences the outcome of the system, something that I would say has been overlooked. Uh, so typically there will be no thermodynamic limit. What you have is to have this population on the interval from 0 to 1 is in statistical physics terms the thermodynamic limit. So typically economists has all, has, is always looking at a very particular case in terms of the number of active players in the system. Discrete choice has actually also been applied to social interactions. There's a huge literature recently where discrete choice with interactions between the individuals, you don't have that so much in the choice of whiskey. Maybe you have some social interaction. If your friends tell you that they prefer a certain brand of whiskey, you would also be, uh, you would also, uh, be more willing to buy that one. But maybe the social interaction component is not so big. Uh, social interaction is perhaps more important in uh, problematic social behavior like school absenteeism, drug uh, addiction, and so on and so forth. And there's a huge number of studies using the concept of discrete choice with social interactions. However, always in a static framework, that means looking at the cross-section of data. For example, data of a uh, cohort of school kids uh, where, you can, where you can infer how many of them uh, show some kind of problematic social behavior and how they are linked to others so that you can you can identify the social interaction component. And again, what we are going to do is to look more at the dynamic evolution of systems with social interactions. I will also dispense quite radically with utility maximization, just for the sake of developing simple models. Of course, afterwards you can then try and find utility functions that would be in harmony or information sets, but I actually will not bother too much about utility maximization and I will simply formulate dynamic behavior models of the time development of agents' decisions or activities. And since we cannot fully capture the agents' idiosyncratic behavioral elements, that's already what popped up in the, in the whiskey example, we adopt the stochastic approach of agents' choice. So there will be some systematic components, but these systematic components will be the input to probabilities for the decision of agents to do alternative one or to follow alternative two. There are systematic parts, but there's also a probabilistic component because there are idiosyncratic motives, there are idiosyncratic information sets and so on that we as the modeler do not know. So it's kind of modesty, so to say, on the part of the model that he does not understand completely the individual decision process. And in order to capture the average behavior of a large population, 
we assume some probabilistic loss. A few motivating examples beyond whiskey for social interaction. Uh, you might think about ad adoption or non-adoption of technologies, yeah, which often which often happens via spillovers, in fact, between users and social interaction between users. In financial markets, and that will be my major example later on, you might think about fundamentalists versus chartist behavior, bears versus bulls in financial markets, and there's cer certainly, or arguably, there is some kind of social interaction. If we speak about herd behavior, of course, that means social interaction that you are more willing to believe in an increase of the stock market if you see many of your peers, of, your, uh, uh, of the other traders out there uh, being bullish and vice versa. And that will be formalized precisely later on. If you go beyond economics, you might think about supporters of government or opposition, some kind of social interaction in the political sphere. And in fact, there has been a lot of work by a few particular groups on using a framework like the one I'm going to present for uh, political science applications with very interesting results. For example, if you think about if you think about things like like uh, upheavals or revolutions, where a lot of uh, a large part of the population at one time starts to starts to interact and starts to oppose the government, think about Germany before unification, and there's certainly an element, important element of social interaction here. It's not individualistic decisions, but it's somebody, uh, somebody following, following the behavior, or many following the behavior of some leaders. Followers or non-followers of fashion should be a standard uh, example for uh, social interaction. And with particular changes of the basic framework and adaptations of the basic framework, what I will be presenting essentially for financial markets, you can adapt and use in order to model these other, this is only a small number of examples, these other uh, areas as well. Okay. So with that motivation, we go into details and I'm going to present to you the basic framework, which is my workhorse, so to say, for behavioral finance models, but can also be used as a workhorse for many different, for many different applications. I consider a population with a binary set of choices or opinions, which I denote by plus or minus. And this is what characterizes all these discrete choice examples, yeah? Adaptation, non-adaptation of technology, being a fundamentalist or being a chartist, being a beer or being a bull in the financial market, supporting the government or supporting the opposition, following fashion or not following fashion. So there are two possibilities. There might be more than two. As you will see later on, you can easily generalize to three, four, five, and so on uh, choice possibilities. You could apply the same framework, but of course all the derivations would be a bit more cumbersome, lengthy, and nasty. And I assume a fixed population, a fixed population of agents in a particular market, say a financial market, or if you think about political science, the voters, the voters in a population, which is a finite number of agents, which is not a continuum on zero one. And all of these agents, without loss of generality, either decide to choose the plus alternative or the minus alternative. Yeah. To follow fashion or not to follow fashion. And two times capital N is the overall number of agents. It's the overall number of agents. The two is only here for convenience because it allows me to avoid that I have a majority of one individual, yeah. of 51 compared to 50. If I have two and then I can also have a balanced situation, but it's not necessary essentially. I can also do without the two. 
So that is my population configuration and what I want to see in a certain environment is how this population configuration evolves over time. How it evolves over time under exogenous influence factors yeah, in a financial market for example, the price might change, information might, might pop up and how it evolves under endogenous interaction which means that the current configuration influences the behavior of agents in the next instant. So somehow they are influenced by how many of their peers are in the plus and in the minus group. And this is going to be formalized then. But I can first simplify a bit because I have a fixed population. I can simply take a measure of the average opinion. So I take the difference between the number of agents in the plus and in the minus group and because of the two here I divide by two. That would be a scalar as the configuration, characterizing the configuration and I can also divide by the number of agents in order to get something that I call an opinion index. The opinion index is the difference between the difference between pluses and minuses in the overall population divided by the total population. And this is then an index that uh, is defined on the interval between minus one and one. Minus one means everyone in the minus group, say pessimistic. Plus one means everyone in the plus group, optimistic. And zero, of course, means an balanced disposition of my population. And this is actually something that you find, but this format you find in many empirical data. Uh, all the business climate or consumer sentiment indices have exactly this format. And they typically have something very close to a binary structure. In business climate or sentiment indices, you ask a certain fraction of the population whether they believe that the economy will be doing well, normally the questions are quite fuzzy, whether the economy will be doing well the next six months or whether it will not be doing well. And you collect the optimistic ones here, you subtract the pessimistic ones and you divide by the overall population and that gives you, that gives you the setting and measure. There's a whole uh, range of sentiment measures for businesses, for consumers, for different sectors that is collected by the European Union uh, for all member states, an immensely large database that has exactly this format. You also have this format in sentiment indices for stock markets where investors, private investors or institutional investors are asked for whether they believe the stock market will go up or down. So there are lots of data out there that exactly have this format. And of course, maybe you can construct data if you are interested in them in a similar way. And of course, the votes that you have, the votes that you have in, in, in politics can also easily be cast into this format. Because here you have the votes for the government or for one party, labor votes for conservatives, and you can cast the election result into the same format. So it's not an unusual data format, but it's something that is quite widespread. Um, and in fact, it's, it's not so often used by economists. The survey uh, database of the European Union uh, is huge, but there's only a small body of economic literature that makes use of these, of these survey data. And you can transform n plus and n minus in this way. So linking it to the socio-economic configuration. Well, that's the basic format of the information we have about the distribution of attitudes, of choices, of opinions in the population. And then we move on to dynamics. And as I said, I assume that the dynamics can be captured by probabilities. And these probabilities are transition probabilities for agents to move between the two groups. That's what they can do, to move from the minus to the plus group and vice versa. And what we want to do is describe their movements, maybe later on explain the dynamic evolution of movement, movements as it is represented in the evolution of a sentiment index, and maybe even forecast, and that would be, that would be cool, the future movements of the population. 
at least over a certain time horizon. Um, P plus minus, that's my idiosyncratic notation. Uh, notation is from the second one to the first one. P minus plus means probability of movements from plus to minus, and P plus minus, minus means probability of movements from minus to plus. So I need to, I need to come up with some hypothesis about what governs on average, because I have probabilities, what governs on average the movements between groups. But for the moment, I just take these probabilities as given. These probabilities later on might have quite complicated forms. They might not be time invariant. They might change over time. They might depend on the state of the system itself. They might depend on the state of the system itself in a very complicated fashion. So they might be non not time invariant and highly nonlinear. But we come to that later on. For the moment, we simply take these probabilities as given. Yeah. And then the population composition simply follows a stochastic process uh, with maybe some systematic components. So just let us work for the moment with given probabilities or time dependent probabilities whatsoever. And then I come immediately to this concept of the master equation, which is a particular term used in statistical physics. It's, it's, it's not used in mathematics per se. So mathematics, you don't have, you don't have a label for this uh, equation. The master equation is simply the complete dynamic characterization of the evolution of the system. And in order to arrive at this, we have to introduce the probability distribution at any point in time over all possible states. This is what we are interested in because it's a stochastic system. So for example, P, N, P of n and t, yeah. the probabilities over all states n in the extensive form where we have numbers of agents here, or in the intensive form where we have the opinion index, that means where we have got rid of the size of the population. Yeah. What I'm interested in is to describe, given my hypothesis about agents' behavior, the dynamic evolution in terms of the evolution of the probability distribution. Yeah. The probability distribution. And of course, if I sum that up from minus n to n, the sum of all probabilities at any point in time is 1. And the same here if I compute the sum from minus 1 to 1. You would still have the size of the population in the sum, right? If this L is formally a fraction by... I would have the size of the population in the number of n tries in the sum, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because these are fractions, yeah. Fractions 1 over n. <coughs> So they change by increments of all over n. Yes. P of n and t is the probability of what? P of n and t is the probability over all possible states n. The possible, the range of possible states n goes from minus n to n, n according to the definition. Fix, fix some, some n and some p, and uh, that's the probability of doing what? Or what? That's the probability of, for me as the researcher observing a certain number of individuals in the plus and minus group, which is summarized in n, yeah. at a point in time, given my hypothesis about the behavior of the system. I may have a starting value, yeah. a starting observation, and I may have, to be introduced in a moment, a hypothesis about the behavior of agents, but it's a stochastic hypothesis. It has stochastic components. So what I can say about the system, if I let it evolve in time, is what my probability for a certain configuration in the next period will be. And I'm seeking for an uh, intuition of what this, this P means. What the probability is always the probability to do something, to change something. What is no, it's the probability of the state. It's the probability you're, you're of the probability state. Ah, see. To, to, to reach a certain to state. Reach the state. Uh, to reach a certain state. Yeah. So these are time dependent distributions. So far, we don't know anything about them because we have not introduced hypotheses. What might be interesting is, and that is something we, we can analyze later on, whether they converge somewhere or not. But this is totally open at the moment. 
we look at the dynamics, and now comes this master equation, the probabilities to find the system, the probabilities for the state, that's what we want. The probabilities to find the system in state n, in one of the different possibilities, n or x, changes over time, of course, according to the probabilities. There are different probabilities here on different levels. According to the probabilities of individuals to switch between groups. Yeah? These are the individual probabilities. And if we take, for example, a change from n to n plus 1 or n minus 1, that means one agent switches from the minus to the plus group. Yeah? Then <coughs> these can be written in the following way. I call them W here. Yeah? The probability the probability for the system to move from n to n plus 1, so that in the next instant I see one <laughs> agent in the plus group. And this is given by the number of agents in the minus group times the time, perhaps time and state dependent probability per agent to move from minus to plus. That's the overall probability. And because of the connection between n minus and n, I can write it in this way. And vice versa, the probability for me to see the system move from n to n minus 1 to have 1 less in the minus group is n plus, the number of plus agents currently that can move to the minus group, times the probability for them to uh, do exactly that movement so that I get n plus times p minus plus. And again, this probability here might be state and time dependent. Yeah. So uh, basically, it's not uh, the picture is not complete here, and it cannot be principally complete because agents here uh, make decisions only on publicly available information because your transition probability depends solely on n, mm -hmm. and there is no way, uh, at least I cannot see it, how you can incorporate and in this framework uh, private information. Uh, we can add private information, of course, but we are more interested here in, uh, so to say, the interactive component. Yeah, but uh, I don't understand uh, I mean, your idea, but uh, uh, when you speak about uh, we interact only through one channel, through the public channel, there is no any other channel uh, in this framework that we can use for interaction. No. I mean, in, in, in economics, uh, agents not only uh, make decisions on uh, public information set, but mm -hmm. also on, on private information set. So, if if uh, if you are engaged mm -hmm. uh, as a group or as an individual mm -hmm. in some sort of games, mm -hmm. then we can aggregate in, in, in local set, mm -hmm. which is again uh, you know, uh, reflected in. in, in, in on, on upper level of application mm -hmm. as well. So here, in this framework, you only look at the top level of aggregation mm -hmm. through the variable n, yeah. abstracting, yeah. absolutely yeah. abstracting everything, yeah. everything. It, and in that sense, the picture, in that sense, the picture is not complete. Um, you can modify, I, I don't do that here, but you can modify in principle the picture to mm -hmm. include private information mm -hmm. of individual agents. I mean, uh, you can include in any case, and that will be shown later on here, more than the intrinsic component. Yeah? Uh, you can include here, for the sake of the argument, at the moment we only have n, we only have the intrinsic dynamics. But you can include here objective economic quantities. That's actually what, what I do if I, if I estimate this model, because we do have influences from the outside world. And you can, in principle, distinguish between different private information sets of agents. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, it's not done here. Because my focus is on the interactive component, on what we, what insights we can get from the interactive component. And I would argue, but maybe that's perhaps something we can discuss over lunch mm -hmm. or over, over 
during tea time, I would argue that in principle economics overstates the importance of private information because it neglects typically the interactive component. So it has to attribute much more of what happens mm -hmm. in the economy, in the financial market. Ah, you want to say that we are the, to the private information. information. We cannot observe private information. We cannot observe it, yeah. but we also, we also overstate uh, and the open. importance, the empirical importance of private information. Mm -hmm. But of course it is there, it is there. I don't, I don't deny it. It sounds that, uh, reasonable. Uh, private <laughs> information exists. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I have another question. Uh, in, in what sense do you mean probabilities? Here? I will make this clear in a moment. Because it's mathematically, it's not, it's probability. not a probability. Mm -hmm. no. It's mm -hmm. a transition. Mm -hmm. okay. Because for, the, for introducing the concept, I use the notion of probabilities. But in a moment, I will move to transition rates because I have a continuous time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this is. Uh, just assuming that we have this, this social interaction effect, which is actually our mo main interest here. And then the transitions are assumed, just answering your question, transitions are assumed to make it a bit more precise, to happen in continuous time, which means that I have what I could call chunk mark of processes. Yeah, time is continuous and individual switches can then be formalized by asynchronous Poisson processes in continuous time. They are all characterized by the same type of Poisson process, but they are not synchronized. So at any instant in time, anyone here could switch or not. And then we can specify the dynamic process more formally via conditional probabilities. If we look at time horizons, time intervals delta t, then we could speak about conditional probabilities, which I now denote by omega, conditional probabilities for the system if it had been in state n to end up in state n plus 1 at time t plus delta t, and so on and so forth. And what I had just introduced before, in fact, turns out to be the transition rates that I get in the limit for infinitesimal time intervals for delta t going to zero. Yeah? That's the definition of what I just called imprecisely probabilities because I have not introduced the continuous time concept so far. That's the transition rate for the population. The transition rate for the population to move from a configuration n to n plus 1. That means in the next instant I will see one more optimistic agent. And to shorten the notation, I simply call this W up the population to move up, become more optimistic, and vice versa, W down, to become more pessimistic. The continuous time framework, in fact, facilitates the analysis because for very small time increments, in the setting, two or more simultaneous movements of individuals become totally unlikely and can be neglected. And this follows directly, in fact, from the Poisson transition probability assumption. If the probability for one individual to change uh, follows a Poisson process with lambda to transition rates, then the probabilities for changes just invoking the Poisson distribution of the population can be written like this, yeah? W up and W down is, as I said before, n minus times p plus minus, and so on and so forth. And because of the Poisson distribution assumption, we have the probabilities, if we have a Poisson rate lambda, the probabilities for n movements over a time interval delta t, described by this nice formula, which we all know, and the probability for one movement becomes lambda delta t times by performing the Taylor expansion of this exponential component here, this one, and the probability of two movements becomes, uh, just inserting n of course, uh, is equal to what we have in this formula. And what we see from uh, this small exercise is that if we allow delta t to go to zero, the dominating term is lambda delta t, lambda times delta t. So we skip all these non-linearities, and in fact, as we see, the probability of two or three or more movements simultaneously in a small instant of time is negligible. 
So we can restrict attention to movements in time, in a continuous time framework of the population, to the nearest neighboring configurations, an immediate consequence, an immediate consequence of the Poisson distribution assumption in continuous time. So the lambda is our probability for the agent's movements. There might be different movements from minus to plus and plus to minus. And the lambda, in fact, in our, in our framework might be st state dependent and nonlinear. But this does not change the outcome here, namely that we only have to consider movements to the nearest states on the left and on the right. So can this lambda depend on uh, this uh, opinion index? Yeah, certainly, whatever you want. Then you have an interactive dependency. And that's, that's our main focus in the applications later on. How the interactive component uh, influences the evolution of the system. So the lambda is, in fact, the lambda is the general com uh, transition rate in the Poisson process that I have used here in order to show that it's only the next neighbors that are interesting of the current state. And the lambda is in our setting, in our setting, uh, this W up or W down. And this W up or W down might depend on, might depend on the current opinion index. And we will see the details in a moment. So and then we look at the overall evolution of the system. And the overall evolution of the system over a finite interval in time might be described by what, what I have uh, announced before, namely what is, what is called the master equation. The overall evolution of the system is the change of the probability distribution, yeah, the probability of all states n from time t to time t plus 1, t plus delta t. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, but it's called Chapman from Pomogoro. You can also call it like this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Kolmogorov uh, equation is an approximation. Uh, the forward Kolmogorov is the same like the Fokker-Planck equation. And this one I will introduce in a moment as an approximation to the more general one. Okay. Because uh, in the forward Kolmogorov you only have drift and diffusion. Yeah. But in general you might have mm, higher order terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These well, higher I mean, order terms are truncated then in the Fokker-Planck yeah. or Kolmogorov equation. So, but this is the general one, uh, and therefore it's called the master equation because it's more general than Kolmogorov. Um, no, so no, I mean, I mean original, ori no, I mean original uh, allocation by, by Kolmogorov is more general. Okay. The, the later allocation, what you call uh, Fokker Planck mm -hmm. allocation, is tran truncated Kolmogorov. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this allocation, I, 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 I guess, is more general. We could also oh, I, give it a name. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I'm but what is, what is, according to my reading of the literature, what is now typically called the forward Kolmogorov equation is exactly the same that another literature calls the Fokker Planck equation. But there might be yeah. some confusion of terminology. Okay. <laughs> so this is the most general characterization of the evolution of the system the time change of the probability over all states. Yeah, from some time t to some time t plus delta t. And this can be simply described in the most general way by bookkeeping of inflow and outflow of probability from and into states. What we have on the left hand side here is, and you have to keep in mind that this is of course an equation that holds for all possible values of n, so it's a vector difference equation, yeah, it's a vector of difference equations, but for any n, the inflow of probability is given by the transition rates yeah, to move from other st states n prime to n times the previous probability of n prime. Yeah. That's the inflow of probability, the inflow of probability, the sum of movements of probability mass from all other states n prime into n. That's what increases p of n. And the second component, of course, mirror image is the outflow of probability, namely the probability to move from state n to any other state n prime. So it's a bookkeeping of the probabilities that gives you the evolution of the system. It's a Markov process. Yeah? It's a Markov process 
And this is the most general, the most general description of the system. If you have a certain hypothesis about these omegas here, these omegas here, then at least you can in principle simulate this master equation and that gives you all that could in principle be known about the system evolution. The complete and exact evolution of the system. But it might be cumbersome to even simulate this vector equation if you have a high number of individuals. You know, then you have, say you have n equal to 1000, then you have 1000 of these interconnected, interconnected difference equations, which is already quite cumbersome to analyze, even to simulate. Here we had to take into account all possible neighboring states, yeah, all possible alternative states and prime, simply because we had a finite delta t. If we consider the same equation in continuous time, then because of the Poisson distribution, we can restrict attention to the neighboring states, which facilitates our uh, efforts. And then in continuous time, the more useful version of the master equation would be the differential equation for the change of the probability distribution, uh, which has the same components on the right hand side, but n prime here would be restricted to the next higher and next lower state. And then restricting attention to the next higher and next lower state, we actually have a very small number of components here on the right hand side. The components are n plus 1 and n minus 1. So if we look at the change of probability of some state n over time, over a small time increment in continuous time, then we get an influx of probability by movements downward from state n plus 1, which means one more optimistic agent before, which becomes pessimistic. Now that increases the probability of n, or one optimistic agent less, namely n minus 1, but this one becoming optimistic also increases the probability of n, and the outflow of probability is given by the transition rates from n to the next higher and next lower state. So it's only the interactions of probability flux with the nearest neighbors in terms of the possibilities that the system has. The process that you get in that way, uh, is it a jump diffusion? Or is it something no, it's not a really jump diffusion. It's not a diffusion. You can approximate it by a diffusion. It's not a jump diffusion. You can approximate it, in particular, if you have a large number of agents by a diffusion process. But no, I don't need, uh, well, you have a finite state Space. So that I mean, if you the Poisson process itself is of course a jump diffusion. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I don't know. Well, is it a diffusion? The fusion property that is not satisfied, or um, you know, why is it not? It's a Markov process. It's a Markov yeah. process. Yeah, yeah. And, and why not a diffusion? Um, no, it is diffused, it is, it, but, it uh, is but diffused, there, is no, yeah. there is no jump because in the next step, the assumption, necessary assumption to this work is to, to as assume that n is large. And then this jump and plus minus one, one becomes continuous. I mean, so no, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. That, that's it, uh, I assume, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and then it's the diffusion, but uh, th there well, are no we jumps. Also, we also will be mm -hmm. looking at the finite, uh, okay. finite size yeah. case at finite numbers of agents. Well, yeah. in the limit, there are no jumps anymore. Yeah, in the, well, in the limit, there are no Yeah, but, but I, I, I... Well, you have jumps all the time. In, in, in so far, you can, you can call it a jump diffusion. Mm -hmm. But there's no simple description in, in, in the sense of uh, how, you would, how you would normally like to formalize jump diffusions. Yeah, I mean, well... I mean, if, I assume that you let delta t go to zero. Yes, yeah. so that yeah. I assume. And then, after that, it is a jump diffusion. You, you can characterize it as a jump diffusion. Yeah. Okay. But you do not have a simple law to describe it as, as you would, uh, as, as these jump diffusions that one uses for asset prices. Yeah, because my next question would have been, can you write it down? This yeah, is a yeah, classical differential equation. No. 
No. You can get approximate stochastic differential equations for mean values uh, and higher moments, and to that we come in a moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. But these are not chunk diffusions anymore, as we will see. Okay. So this is what we get uh, if we go to continuous time. We only have to look at the nearest neighbor configurations, and then we have a finite number of possibilities of probability flows uh, that we have to track. And now we go, go a bit more into, into assuming particular forms of uh, transition rates for the individuals. We assume here, but this is not crucial in fact, we assume here that uh, the transitions of individuals uh, do not depend on the raw numbers. We could also assume that they depend on the raw numbers, then the system behavior changes somehow, but on the ratio of members in those groups. So you have x as an influence factor on the behavior of individuals. There's a self-referential self uh, behavioral regularity here. And then we get for w up that it depends on x by assumption. The transition rate for the population to move upward, so for one more to become optimistic, which means that in the next instant, instead of x, you have x plus 1 over n. 1 over n is the increments of the opinion index x because it changes by 1 over n. And this uh, transition rate is given by, as we had before, the number of pessimistic agents times their probability, times their probability to move to the optimistic group. And this is now assumed to depend itself on x. So this now brings into our picture a behavioral assumption, and what we want to do is to find out what uh, implications it has. And vice versa, of course, we assume that for the plus agents to move to the pessimistic group uh, also involves a transition rate that has the self-referential nature also depends on x. Then we end up with the master equation for the opinion index x, which again has the possibilities of inflow of probability from the next higher and the next lower state, and outflow of probability to these neighboring states, and gives us the intensive characterization of the system behavior. And now comes Fokker Planck, or forward Kolmogorov, because that is typically or will turn out to be not really manageable analytically. So, what you can do is to approximate it in order to get some more easy, easily handleable uh, apparatus. And the standard, the standard way to approximate it is to move from the master equation to the Fokker-Planck equation, which is a Taylor series expansion of the formula, a particular Taylor series expansion. We assume that n is large, as you have already indicated. OK, make a short break. Uh -huh. 